the, the terminology, but when you know, they start talking about something else, so I understand their death is missing because they never taught into this. So I'm teaching it because of purpose. So that whenever I talk to them, I, 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 think, I think it's perfectly fine. That's not the question why you are teaching. Okay. It. Now second, <laughs> now second is absolutely fine for the point you are trying to make. Let me start with the video. How how many of you have seen that Debray uh, birth of a word? Only one. So let me play the video. Not one. And and then I'll jump to my class. I know, I know this guy, so maybe we've seen it. Not the full one. So language acquisition is a you know kind of very well studied. Uh, I believe. Video wise. I believe I need to uh, share. That is a. It's already shared, right? Uh, you did it on KIL. <laughs> Not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. Okay, you share the whole screen now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, let me. Imagine if you could record your life, everything you said, everything you did, available in a perfect memory store at your fingertips. So you could go back and find memorable moments and relive them, or sift through traces of time and discover patterns in your own life that previously had gone undiscovered. Well, that's exactly the journey that my family began five and a half years ago. This is my wife and collaborator, Rupal. And on this day, at this moment, we walked to the house with our first child, our beautiful baby boy. And we walked into a house with a very special home video recording system. This moment and thousands of other moments special for us were captured in our home because in every room in the house, if you looked up, you see a camera and a microphone. And if you look down, you get this bird's eye view of the room. Here's our living room, the baby bedroom, kitchen, dining room, and the rest of the house. And all of these fed into a disk array that was designed for continuous capture. So here we are flying through a day in our home as we move from sunlit morning through incandescent evening, and finally lights out for the day. Over the course of three years, we've recorded eight to 10 hours a day, amassing roughly a quarter million hours of multi-track audio and video. So you're looking at a piece of what is by far the largest home video collection ever made. I think that's clear. And what the data represents for our family at a personal level, the, the, the impact has already been immense and we're still learning its value. Countless moments of unsolicited natural moments, not posed moments, are captured there. And we're starting to learn how to discover them and find them. But there's also a scientific reason that drove this project, which was to use this kind of natural longitudinal data to understand the process of how a child learns language, that child being my son. And so with many privacy provisions put in place to protect everyone who was recorded in the data, we made elements of the data available to my trusted research team at MIT so we could start teasing apart patterns in this massive data set, trying to understand the influence of social environments on language acquisition. So we're looking here at one of the first things we started to do. This is my wife and I cooking breakfast in the kitchen. And as we move through space and through time, every pattern of life in the kitchen, in order to convert this opaque 90,000 hours of video into something we can start to see, we use motion analysis to pull up as we move through space and through time, what we call space-time worms. And this has become a part of our toolkit for being able to look and see where the activities are in the data. And with it, trace the patterns of, in particular, where my son moves throughout the home so we can focus our transcription efforts all the speech environment around my son, all the words that he heard from myself, my wife, our nanny, and over time, the words he began to produce. 
So with that technology and that data and the ability to, with machine assistance, transcribe speech, we've now transcribed well over 7 million words of our own transcripts. And with that, let me take you now for a first tour into the data. So you've all, I'm sure, seen time-lapse videos where a flower will blossom as you accelerate time. I'd like you to now experience the blossoming of a speech form. My son, soon after his first birthday, would say gaga to me in water. And over the course of the next half year, he slowly learned to approximate the proper adult form, water. So we're going to cruise through half the year in about 40 seconds. No video here. So you can focus on the sound, the acoustics of a new kind of trajectory. Got to water. So he didn't just learn water. Over the course of the 24 months, the first two years that we really focused on, this is a map of every word he learned in chronological order. And because we have full transcripts, we've identified each of the 503 words that he learned to produce by his second birthday. He was an early talker. And so we started to analyze why. Why were certain words born before others? This is one of the first results that came out of our study uh, a little over a year ago that really surprised us. The way to interpret this apparently simple graph is on the vertical is the indication of how complex character utterances are based on the length of utterances. And the vertical axis is time. And all of the data we align based on the, the following idea. Every time my son would learn a word, we would trace back and look at all of the language he heard that contained that word. And we would plot the relative length of the utterances. And what we found was this curious phenomenon that character of speech would systematically dip to a minimum, making language as simple as possible, and then slowly ascend back up to complexity. And the amazing thing was the, that bounce, that dip, lined up almost precisely with when each word was born, word after word, systematically. So it appears that all three primary caregivers, myself, my wife, and our nanny, were systematically, and I would think subconsciously, restructuring our language to meet him at the moment of the birth of the word and bring him gently into more complex language. And the implications of this, there are many, but one I just want to point out is that there must be amazing feedback loops. It's not, of course, my son learning from his linguistic environment, but the environment is learning from him. That environment, people are in these tight feedback loops and creating a kind of scaffolding that has not been noticed until now. But that's looking at the speech context. What about the visual context? We're now looking at, think of this as a doghouse cutaway of, the, of our house. We've taken those circular fish island cameras and we've done some optical correction, and then we can bring it into a three-dimensional light. So welcome to my home. This is a moment, one moment captured across multiple cameras. The reason we did this is to create the ultimate memory machine where you can go back and interactively fly around and then read video life into this system. What I'm going to do is give you an accelerated view of 30 minutes, again, of just light in the living room. That's me and my son on the floor. And there's video analytics that are tracking our movements. My son is leaving red ink, I'm leaving green ink. We're now on the couch looking out through the window, a car is passing by, and finally my son playing in a walking toy by himself. Now we freeze the action, 30 minutes. We turn time to the vertical axis, and we open up 
for a view of these interaction traces we've just left behind. And we can see these amazing structures. These little knots are two colors of, of thread we call social hotspots. The spiral thread we call it a solo hotspot. And we think that these affect the way languages learn. What we'd like to do is start understanding the interaction between these patterns and the language that Python is exposed to to see if we can predict how the structure of when words are heard affects when they're learned. So in other words, the relationship between words and what they're about in the world. So here's how we're approaching this. In this video, again, my son is being traced out. He's leaving red ink behind, and there's our nanny by the door. You want to go there? He comes with the water, and off go the two ones over to the kitchen to get water. And what we've done is use the word water to tag that moment, that bit of activity. And now we take the power of data and take Every time my son ever heard the word water and the context he saw it in, and we used it to penetrate through the video and find every activity trace that co-occurred with the instance of water. And what this data leaves in its wake is a landscape. We call these wordscapes. This is the wordscape for the word water. And you can see most of the action is in the kitchen. That's where those big peaks are over the left. And just for contrast, we can do this with any word. We can take the word bye as a goodbye. And we're now zoomed in over the entrance to the house. And we look and we find, as you'd expect, a contrast in the landscape where the word bye occurs much more in a structured way. So we're using these structures to start predicting the order of language acquisition. And, and that's uh, sort of ongoing work now. Okay, now we'll so jump into something else. Yeah. Well, I have a response to this one, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And I'm sure Savannah's thinking the same thing. This is about the acquisition of the lexicon. Uh -huh. The point that I was making pertains to the acquisition or the articulation of the grammar, the syntax. And it's that syntax that seems to be constrained by innate language processes, or at least some kind of rule-based process. So yeah, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. The acquisition of the lexicon and the acquisition of the syntax of the grammar. Absolutely agree. So all this research is, you know, available papers, and in, you know, fortunately, the data is also available, anonymized. And I mean, yeah, if you can you want to have a look, you can. <laughs> now let's let's jump to our NLP business. Okay. Any point question? What I taught in the last class. Everybody is good. Okay. So before I start today, so I talked about Jeff's law. I talked about distribution, right? I talked about basic language modeling. I talked about perplexity, how to calculate. Now two notion here. I mean, I'm just you know uh, not taking the student name, but I talked to a student and you know uh, that person told me, well, language model also produce embedding for word and sentence. So what's the difference? Now what I'm trying to make is. So this is two different process. Making word embedding, basically the vector representation of word is being a long study problem. It's not new, okay? And then using those word embedding to use them in the language modeling is the second problem. Now, what happened? Everything is toolkit. We download and we don't understand, but I will make that connection today. So let me just go over through all these things. Go on, go on. The Dave Roy's video is being shared into our Google chat group in 2021. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody shared it. Okay. So now you, you remember this table, right? Everybody? Co-location table. Simple. Now I'm trying to rectify a word. What I can do, you know, very basic way. I can take a row for the one, and I can say this is my vector representation. One hot vector does not work, we talked about. Every time distance is root two. It was x minus, you know, x root square and y minus y square. So basically, Euclidean distance always root two. So I can take this uh, row and say this is my vector. Although I have a lot of problems, and that problem people solve over the time. So this is the basic vector indication. We are still not there in the language model. So I believe we already talked about. Uh, Okay. 
the intuition is public publicity is very clear, right? So language model has to predict one word in the next hour. Okay. Now let's talk about the connection. The question Koshika the last class. So if we already know what is the distribution, how it looked like, like Jeff's law, then how we can use it. Okay. So the use of it. Well, so what we learn, see, if we have a larger n, then our prediction accuracy is very high. If we if we consider context, seven word context, eight word context, prediction is very high. If we take lower n, then maybe we can shake it, but we have more, you know, uh, what to say, more options to see, right? So what how? Doctor said that. Uh, doctor okay. See, we are trying to predict yeah. the next word. Right? Yeah. That's our language modeling problem. Now let's say you are typing in your mobile phone. When you are typing the first word, what is the probability of predicting right by your mobile phone? Versus when you are typing your fifth word, what is the probability of this? It will be correct. Yeah. Because now the system has more context. Yeah. Right? Now the argument with the, over the NLP community was what is the base size of N? Because if I take larger size of N, I might not have seen that several times in my corpus. Yeah. Because language is so, you know, uh, versatile. But if I take smaller amount of N, I might get more option, but not correction. So how I can balance this n based on language, based on domain, and what? So okay. smaller is better, or larger is better. Okay. So and the answer is we don't know. There's a sweet spot. Okay. Mm -hmm. For for English, typically you can say somehow is now. This a three gram is the best option. But let's say you go to more complex language, like German, Chinese. Maybe three gram is not enough. You have to take five grams and so on. Okay. So what I'm saying is now I'm trying to learn this distribution over the corpus, right? language modeling. So what we know, Jeff said, no matter what happened, this will be your distribution. And he proved it. And we have seen this over you know, several years. It's not that we believe him in one day. It has been seen over the last 50 years. So I want to just yeah. add something here, yeah. and that is about semantics. Hmm. So early days, uh, when we um, started building a tree trees in 2008 and in 2009, um, we uh, started to look at uh, the word clouds and uh, phrases. Actually, words were not uh, seeing, you know, the popular thing about, you know, one gram is showing the words and which is almost one is not very valuable. Foreign affairs is far more meaningful than foreign or affairs or anything of that nature, right? And um, we, we created um, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, Word cl uh, uh, phrase clouds, uh, and um, we showed that uh, compared to the phrase cloud, uh, something that was put in the context. So we are talking about here, India, you know, India and Pakistan terrorism, you know, foreign affair office. In those contexts, um, the political, geopolitical, those kind of contexts. In that context, the different sets of um, you know, uh, phrases that were, were a lot more meaningful and identifying and showing uh, occurrences of those phrases in the, you know, corpus in the tweets uh, was what was valuable. So I want to um, disagree with, uh, you know, uh, uh, anything that comes from just data driven of, you know, options saying here are the, you know, words or phrases we find. And I want to say that the uh, human context, the context, the world context, uh, it plays very important role in conveying the meaningful information about that situation. At the end of the day, through this cloud of phrases, we wanted to understand what is frequently discussed in context of what problem and so on and so forth, right? What what what, what is getting attention in, uh, in this um, event, uh, you know, terrorism event and such, and that um, uh, the value, the importance of those. Uh, clouds is to convey the information to the user and that uh, in uh, coming up with those clouds having additional you now you call you know data and knowledge knowledge driven component is also very valuable to provide valuable context to decide what is likely to be more meaningful important high density information conveying to the user just wanted to point that out say that this, these are all data driven i do not Subscribe that these are the most meaningful things to do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that later. So, uh, okay, so let, let us see, you know, the basics of, you know, language model. Okay, so what do you know? So let's say I got this data point. So the, let's say this is my data point. 
I learn this distribution. Now GIF says no matter what will happen, we'll get the Pareto optimal. Right? That's the that's the thing. We learn. So what we can do? So 90s, the whole 90s, or let's say at least half of it, the, you know, IR community have and NLP community, at least the statistical believer of the NLP community, have been busy in doing smoothing. So what is smoothing? Very simple idea. So what are we saying? Let's say there's a Robin Hood. Everybody understood Robin Hood, right? Yeah. So there's a Robin Hood who can steal wealth from the from the wealthier people and distribute over the forest in the in the data. So what is the problem? So NLP has a lot of problems. First of all, out of vocabulary problem. No matter how good your dictionary is, you will never be able to complete it. And there will be unseen words, name entities, and so on. So what you do, you know this is your distribution now. You take the GIFs law and optimize this in the way that it's supposed to be. Because you know it will happen. Okay? You understand? So taking a knife, cutting the car. This is called smoothing. How? Okay. Okay. So this is the basic form of smoothing for people to track. It's called add one or lap plus. Okay. So what do we do? We have the count of two words here. What I minus one, what I divide by my I minus one. Right? This is my probability. What I'm doing now, I'm saying that a lot of unseen words, they're not zero. I'm putting one to them. Okay. And since I'm giving one, I'm disturbing the you know distribution, I'm dividing by the total number of vocabulary. So B. Okay. Anybody with me? So what I get simply, I get the GIFs distribution or the optimal distribution in my column. Right? But maybe not some disturbance. So with this, what I can do now, when I'm see earlier than there's people used to do multiplication. And if you have zero in some multiplication, you get zero, right? Then people come up with a different thing. So now you don't have zero. You have 10 to zero, 0, 0.0000 something, but it's not zero, okay? <clears throat> so this is the lattice. So with this, if you remember this table, the location table, instead of these zeros, now what you have? One. This is add one, smoothing. You put one, you know, divide it by, your vocabulary size, right? So what do you get? A lot of tiny, tiny numbers, but your distribution is now sorted to this parrot optimal. Okay? So <clears throat> this has been a topic um, for many years, and I can, you know, I can spend time talking about this for four plus. There are 15 uh, in my, you know, knowledge, there might be more. So, yeah. Yes, I can. Um, so you said that um, if you want to create an embedding for these words, we can just pay. Yeah. So okay, okay. So let me clarify more. <clears throat> so let's say you want to embed Chinese in vector space. You can take this row out. Okay. And you can take so normal count is not good. It's not you know optimized. You can take PMI, PPMI, and so on and so forth. Right? No, no, no. That, that is fine. My oh. question is something else. I answer if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is it guaranteed that there will not be a repetition of the rows? No, the that is guaranteed. So when I'm getting a data, I'm making vocabulary size unique. Vocabulary means unique words. Okay, I don't care about go and going. Those are two words too. Okay. 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 So I get all the vocabulary. So my matrix is square matrix. So number of vocabulary by number of numbers. Right? Now there, there are a lot of other things. You can do bigram versus bigram. A lot of things people did. I don't want to talk about that, but you understand? Yeah, but for a large enough vocabulary. Um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be hitting that problem in next few because we'll be hitting Google. Okay. We're, we're now beginning of 90s. Next, we'll be hitting Google. Yeah, no, maybe I'm missing a point, but I'm not able to understand uh, what exactly guarantees that two rows are not going to be the same. No, no, no. See, we have unique vocabulary, right? Okay. Let's say you have 80,000 words. So 80,000, those words have a different pattern of occurring. So how uh, two words could be same? There's no way, right? And if you have a very large corpus. I think it's not about two words being same. It's about the pattern of two words occurring okay. being same. Uh, it could be in you know, some fluke way, but rather impossible. Let's say two, two examples should be to my house or to my apartment. 
So what is the word? Apartment and house. Oh, exactly. So that's a very good point. So you talked about two words which are mutually exclusive. Yeah. I will exactly talk about this in some few slides. Just hold on this point. It's a very good point. Okay. And size of the vocabulary, that's the point I will you know, touch in information retrieval. Do you have anything else in mind? No. So two words could be same. Yeah. Hardly possible. Okay. Yeah, I agree, but I'm not uh, like, convinced. Not convinced. Okay. So we'll, we'll argue back on this. Just just go with it. So there are maybe very rare two words uh, are this the corpus. Maybe. No, this example it will be same. Yeah, but should be. So so this is not a rare word, apartment and house. Right. So those, those are those are basically synonymous words. Right. But for example, let's say there are two rare words and uh, the occurrence is let's say one or two times. And the sentence structure is same. The uh, the surrounding words are same. Okay. Then maybe so, maybe a rare word. Okay. So exactly information at will Okay. So I have that example. Okay, fine. But let me wrap this up. Okay. I don't want to. Okay. So from early, you know, around 87, 88 to 95. This is the time there are a lot of research on spooning tech. Even when I started my NLP journey in my undergrad, I used to do name entry recognition and transliteration for Indian languages. I did work a lot on and there are almost 15, you know, this, you know, you can go to this link. There is a very, you know, comprehensive study on all those coding techniques, how to work and so on. So now, so why, what is the problem? See, you want a distribution, you want to forcefully restore it to GStore. Now, how you can do that? That's a challenge. So there are a lot of methods, okay? So that people discussed. You are good here? Let us see up. Maybe you answered this before, but no, I feel no question is silly question. That's a why would you want to fit anything to smoothing or Gipslow? Okay, that is actually in the last class. Okay, okay. so Gipslow says, uh, so we are trying to model language in using statistical probability, right? So earlier people failed to do it in normal distribution. Then Gipslow came in and said, okay, actually, what frequency is actually proportional to so what rank? So basically, this curve, if you plot it, take the data purpose and plot it, you'll always get this pattern. Explain why words would be not in the normal distribution they came up. Okay, so for that, I, I don't want to repeat this already discussed in the last class. The video is available, and if you still have question, we're happy to you know, take that. Thanks. But we are good here. I'm just trying to tell you the story, how we reach out here. It's not that we have reached out here. So go over here if you're interested, look at. <clears throat> now, how many of you have seen this video? You Google as a guy? Yeah. One, two, three. Good. Okay. <clears throat> now what happened? Google that. Search in. And we hit a lot of other problems. Okay. So I have a video, it's a funny video, just to understand how complex it is. But it's a, it's a nice one. Watch it and then I'll jump in. <laughs> Hello there. Is today tomorrow New Zealand? Yes. Foot same like Europe. What? Itch. Same like Europe. Gmail.com. Oh what? Bitcoin. Are your parents home? Miss Pippi. In Mississippi? Hey, I'm not a dictionary. My grandson Nathan. Sound the girls. <laughs> Just, it's a long one. I just want to show you. 
last one minute so that I come on. Why am I late? How can I? Ah, yeah, 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 it's going. Let me play this is just one half minute. Yes. Can you please stop that? Just... Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, come on in. It is Jackson Pollock's birthday, so we're uh, celebrating his particular style of painting. My part smell. The most important painters of all time, and you want to know why parts smell. So there you go. Flight to Washington. Then transfer all money to Toka Coin How? Okay, class. <laughs> Search avoid being bullied for wearing glasses. <laughs> Flight to Washington State. I need that mistake. Your mouth is stuck. Why watch two shaped like a orange slide? You are so wrong, dumbass. We will see. Groundhog's Day or Groundhog Day? Groundhog Day. No! Haircut place, full cut. Terror pictures? Oh. A sorry. Terrier picture. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hey, man, let me do my job. Where's your screen door injured? Where are my pet Russian dolphin? Why do my farts smell? Tent. Doing a little camping, huh? Tentacle head. Oh, come on! Open for business, everyone. Come on in. It's awesome in here. Soon. I'm soon. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the that's a big you know stake you know if I have taken now they are saying we will be getting a lot of traffic. <laughs> anyway, so let let's see the next one. Okay, so searching in problem come to us. Okay, so it's a very very big data set, right? Wave. <coughs> we'll be touching upon all the points you you know covered. So this was our problem, right? We have a very large collection and what we want to give results in nanoseconds, just fraction of time. So it's just to give an understanding let's say you have this amount of data and average size of the page is 20 kb then you have 10 you know 10 billion then it's a size and that time if you want to read in the disk you know hard disk of that time so this is the speed of you know 50 mb per second then to read that data will take you know 46 days over the internet and so on so that was the challenge that time okay so people you know did a lot of things to overcome uh, this kind of challenges well the basic architecture of search engine how it works we know index, right? How the index work? We have a vocabulary. Your question, we have a vocabulary, let's say 80K, let's say. Okay, it's not 80K, so we scale. Okay, let's say 80K. And we have rows representing word. We have column representing what? Problems. This is my index, right? Now, what I'm keeping? One or zero. If that were present in that document, one, other way, zero. Although this is not today's search engine does, but this is the basic one. Right? Now, what it will happen? You can understand. Your column number is astronomical, huge. Okay? Vocabulary size is also very huge. Not that big, but reasonably big. So this is the basic setup. Let's say we have you know uh, index all the Shakespeare right? and you know, all the character Antony Brutus, you know California, Cleopatra, blah blah. And then what do you have to, have to do? Let's say we have a you know, quite like this, Caesar and California, wife of Caesar, and we want to find out all the, you know, documents or the phrases or whatever, paragraph, which con consists of that. What you can do, we take Caesar. Now you get vector division idea also here, okay? We take Caesar and say, this is my vector, 1010, one, okay? We take California, take the vector, we do what? And operation. What do you get? 100100. Zero, 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 zero. So basically you pick up, those words, those documents. And okay, this document consists of both the words. Problem sort, right? The basic setup of searching. Problem is not solved, but this is the, this is the basic thing. Okay, anybody with me? Any question here? No. Okay, so this is the you know, output if you, if you think that.
Sorry, it's not going. Yeah. Okay. Now, we've started growing like anything, right? A lot of problems. Number one problem is no matter how good your vocabulary is, it will be never complete. And we are seeing a lot of new words every day. Okay, there are words which are connected in some unnatural way. We can't make them possible, you know, to learn in some prior way. So can we learn something from the web and put it back in our indexing style? All a lot of things happen, you know, how to handle multiple <coughs> occurrences of word who are, you know, kind of context. Uh, uh, contiguous, how to do that in, in this interval, etc. So, a lot of research happens. I'm not going there. So, now here's an example to you know motivate you. Let's say angry and birds. These two words never been seen together until unless angry bird game come into play. Because these two words have never any relation because we did not know that you know birds could be angry as well. Only this game, <laughs> game has told us you know, bird could be angry. So, now can we learn this connection from the data? Because we can't manage wave scaling manually. We have to do something you know, automatically. <clears throat> so the idea is, if I, I have now index table, which is D1, D2, and blah, blah, blah. So can I learn what are the two words or multiple two words? They co-appear at the document level, paragraph level. Also a lot of research people did, you know, first paragraph, second paragraph, blah, blah, blah. I don't go there. But as a document level, how they co-appear at document level, can I learn the relation? So the DIs are still documents. Right. And uh, the numbers corresponding to them are relations. Okay. Now you can you know think about this PMI, the PMI, whatever it is. Okay, not exactly the number of occurrences. No, so that is not skipped. Okay. Right? So we talked about PMI earlier, right? If two words co-appear multiple times, we can calculate PMI. Point wise, mutual, you know, um, information. So now we are trying to do the same, but better than PMI. Motivation is clear, what are you trying to do? So let's say how to do that, how people did that in that time. So here's the formula. So <clears throat> the concept of uh, the, you know, co oh, okay, so correlation coefficient is the, is the method, okay? And people got really crazy about this during 95, okay, around that time. So it says correlation coefficient is a statistical measure, degree of which changes the value of one variable to other variable. You might say, we, we already have Pearson correlation, but that's a static correlation. But here we are trying to understand the degree of variation as well in the vector space. Okay, so that's the difference. So basically we are calculating the coefficient in which way it will be going. So here's the measure. So if it is one, that means every positive increase of one variable will be affecting the other variable as well. Okay, so for example, uh, this is shoe size grow up and definitely the foot length also grow up. That's the kind of correlation coefficient. And if it is minus one that says that, for example, amount of gas in the tank decreases in almost perfect correlation with speed. And if it is zero, that means it has no correlation. Okay. Is the problem set up clear? Then I'll go to the map. Fine. Okay. Now this is the formulation. What are we doing? Sigma xy divided by sigma x and sigma y. Very similar to PMI. Count of x, y divided by count of x and count of y. But little different. We break it down to this formulation. So basically standard deviation and population of covariance and population of mean. So this is our formulation. Okay. So now let us see how to calculate this. Then again, come back to math. Because math sometimes do not understand. Let's see example. Let's say we have x and y. And consider for easiness, consider these are real numbers. Okay? So not no fraction for the time. Okay, so let's say these are the numbers x and y has. And we are trying to calculate what? Correlation coefficient of x and y. Okay, with me? So let's calculate this one. x, y, x, y, root, you know, x square and y square. So basically, summation of x square. Okay, so let's calculate x prime y. Okay, x y forty one into three point two. Fine, we get summation of x y. Fine, x square 
41 square, 42 square, summation of x square, clear. y square, 3.2 square, summation of y square. Calculation is clear. Fine. x, y, x, y, x square, x, y square. What we will do now? We formulate this. Okay. So we have now summation of x, x square, you know, what is this one? Mean of x. What is mean of x? What should be the mean of x? Can you do? In, no. Just, just in your head. 43. Huh? 43. Exactly. So 43, right? So mean of x is 43. Right? So you take mean of x. Now you do what? Sigma and sigma. Right? I don't know how. What do you get? 10. Right? <clears throat> I'm not going into the details. I mean, you can take my side and you know, recalculate if you want to. So what is the y value? I can calculate similar way, 0 0.1, and I can do this whole calculation, and I'm getting here 1. What does in 1 mean? They are highly series also asking question. OK, so, so what do you get? x and y is highly coded. Let us go back to the formula. Let us really look at the formula. You understand? Good. So now understand from the basic PMI, we come to correlation coefficient area. And now we have a huge corpus. And we are, you know, about to learn this kind of correlation. And we learned well. So there was a concept in, uh, I, I think it still has, in um, information retrieval. So what typically happens? You give a query. Query is what? Basically, a bunch of words. And that is tend to be very small. Right? The documents are very large. So what people do? Augmentation of your query, query enhancement. So basically, you take your words, go to some kind of this kind of data set, which is which already calculated this earlier, and you get more words and join with your query, and then sort your data. Try to get more relevant documents, right? So that you know method affects a lot using this method, and you can you get new data in two days. That time Google used to do re in every seven days. Now, how they do, I don't know. It's a, it's a you know, matter of their business. So every seven days you get new data. You can do this and put back, right? So it's a continuous <coughs> process. Okay. Again, there are a lot of variation of correlation coefficient. People study a lot. There are thousands of papers available. What I taught you is a simple one. But there are variations on the level. Go to this link, see a lot of variations. So, figure paper full of, you know, correlation, sorry, correlation coefficient, that era, and people worked on this like crazy. Everybody good here? Good. Oh. Your question, possibly. <laughs> so, it's not about the dimension of the vector. It's about the right force. So basically, how effective my vector space is, how meaningful my vector space is. So basically, the NLP researchers, also the part of NLP researcher who believe in statistical way of doing things, they have been arguing this. So how do I know my vector space is good? Correlation coefficient might be very good. Uh, what to say? It's a company way to solve the problem, but does it actually solve the problem? What do you want to do? So then they started doing a nice thing. I'll talk about this. I, I think everybody knows about it, but I'll re-emphasize on this. Okay. Purposeful. So what happened? Singular authority competition, the idea came into picture. And that's the revolution in the information retrieval of that era. Why? I'll explain that. Okay. So what it does? Simple. So singular authority decomposition. I believe you will get thousands of material over online. What you want to take from me is intuition. Okay, so take the intuition from me. Learn the mathematics somewhere else. Now let's say you know that's you know SPT, right? You get U sigma and P transpose. You want to break it down into three matrices, the bigger one, right? Why I'm talking about this? Because my problem is my index table is so large, right? 
I can't work with that. So what Google user want? Results in nanoseconds. Your index table is huge. You want to solve the problem. Okay. So here is okay. So you get U. So let's say this is your original matrix. And let's say, for example, this matrix is nothing but let's say, let's say you have a Netflix account which you share. And everybody has an account. Okay. And the movie you watch over the weekend, you rate them. Five, four, three, two, one. Five is very likely, one is bad. Okay. <clears throat> so if you see, these are my user. On the contrary, information retrieval, these are my words. And these are my documents. So here, these are my users. These are my movies. Okay. So what you can see, that this people is basically what? Sci-fi movie level. Right. And these people here are romance movie level. Now, what we need to learn mathematically is reveal this pattern, which is not being told to the system. Because if you give a very large metric, this kind of pattern exists. So how can I reveal this pattern by SPD? That's a motive. Okay. Although I cannot name it, I cannot say this is sci-fi, but I should be able to get the pattern out. Okay. So here it is. So you break it down to you. This is your U. This is your sigma, which is a diagonal matrix. And this is the V transpose. The horizontal matrix. Right? So what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to reduce the dimension. Why I want to do that? Because think about your astronomical you know, index table, which has full wave on your documents and words <coughs> in a row. Now you can't compute that. You want to reduce the dimension and you want to get the same accuracy. Okay. So what sigma actually tell us? This is the eigen, eigen values, right? So based on some eigen value, I decide how many you know dimension I'll, I'll cut. So if I say I will take only the you know major two dimension, so I will take only the major two dimension. Yeah. Okay. So already here. So okay. So let's look at this. So let's say this, this one. Okay, I have so many diagonal eigenvalues. I decide these two are my major. I will reduce this to two. So what I will do? I will cut down. So what I will get? Ideally, same information, but in a squeeze vector space. Okay, with me. So how SVD work in practice? This is your point. I will come back. Okay. So what I used to do in my class, I used to go through this example. Okay. Let's say I have three documents. Document one, ship pen of gold damage, blah, blah. Document two, delivery of silver, blah, blah. And document three. Now what I have, I have a query. What is the query? I wrote query somewhere. So LSI was uh, invented at uh, uh, Belcore, Bell Communications Research. Uh, Susan uh, Davidson was Susan. She was my colleague, and uh, then she later on, uh, after I moved out, I moved out of, uh, and, and I had a project uh, using LSI. So in the context of uh, the Info Harness project, we did have, uh, you know, some use of this. The Susan has moved to uh, Microsoft Research, where she's still there. Is she's still there? Is this example from Welling Book? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let me go through this. Very quickly, and what I want to. Okay, so these are the terms. Okay, so this is my total vocabulary. This is my query, and these are my words. So total vocabulary is this one. So what I can do, I can represent my matrix of documents. Basically, one zero one zero, and that is my query. Okay. So what ideally I should do, if I'm doing information retrieval, I'll take the query, I'll take the vector of the document, I'll do some kind of thing, cosine, jcar, blah blah. I will say, okay, this document is first, this document is second, this document is third. So, by the way, what is document first and second and third? Here, if, the, if I give this query. Yeah, so this is the query, and these are the documents. So, in your opinion, what should go first, second, third? Any document can go. The document? No order? This is your query. Gold, silver, okay, the largest length of the document. Anybody want to comment anything? 
What is the ranking it should be? Uh, based on how similar it is to the query. Right. D2, okay. D2, D3, D3, D2, D3, and D1. D2, D3, D2. Any, anybody else? No. Okay. So, what we'll be doing, we'll be taking this vector, uh, so this matrix, we'll do what? SBT, single level decomposition, and we'll, we'll get this you know, sigma. That's my sigma. Okay, this one. And I say, okay, so two dimension is enough for me. I cut down to two dimension, and I cut it down to this one. Okay, and also the V transpose. And I calculate the similar thing um, for query and do the other also cut down the you know query factor into two. And I have this new squeeze dimension of vectors. I calculate the you know similarity, basically cosine similarity here. And I get this ranking D2, D3, and D1. So in my class, what I used to do, I used to show the you know. Uh, the difference. If I take the actual matrix versus if I take the SBD matrix, then I'm getting the same results. Okay, are you good with me? So why this is so important? Because now, instead of this astronomical number of columns, you are able to do the same calculation in two dimensions, which is way faster. Mm -hmm. And that's the revolution, because that is needed for the time. Right? Everybody understood yeah. what I'm trying to say? Now, this opens up a lot of questions. This innovation happened in IL, IL domain. Now, NLP research has become, you know, again, the statistical people become, you know, wow. I mean, we can use it, right? But we don't understand what this dimension say. That's okay, that's another problem. Now, it also solves another issue which people have been struggling. And this is the question what Jiran does. So, words like, Let's say human and let's say you know user, machine and system, they are kind of mutually exclusive. Right? I mean, one seat at the location, the other does not appear. They are, they are actually synonyms, right? So in my earlier whatever factorification mechanism I talked about, PMI and this and that, correlation coefficient, etc., was not able to capture this. So in the in my vector space, basically the distance between human and user, machine and system. Should they should be close by in my vector space, and that's the why I say my vector space is meaningful. Otherwise, my vector space is not meaningful. Yes. So this table exactly talks about what I was saying. So if you see the row corresponding to human and the row corresponding to machine, mm -hmm. they are the same values across mm. all columns. No, no, no. <laughs> so, okay, okay, so, so there, there are abbreviations. So there are dot dot dot. There are dot yeah. there are dot dot dot. This is exactly an example of what. Okay, uh, okay, okay. So there are dot dot dot. Dot 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 means uh, <laughs> there, there are many, many other other rows and numbers. So again, my 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 comment to you is same. See what you are saying, Mecha, is is maybe possible, but the probability is very less. Okay. But I'm addressing Jiren this question. Jiren, you you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Right, and everybody else. So basically, words like this become very closer in the vector space after using support vector machine. A single for SBD. And people got crazy in you know, NLP domain. How this is happening? We have been trying all possible ways nowadays, and that not happen, and this happens. And SVD also helps to learn words which are connected, not grammatically. They also started coming close by. Obviously, there are variation of SVD, you know, how you can factorize SVD, eigenvalue factorization, you can you know do matrix multiplication, and many other, other formulation happen. So people got excited. And that's the journey of what vector started. The model before what to be given. Okay. So this is understood. Yeah, we have good time. Until this point, things are fine. Now I'll jump into neural network and what to pick, I'll jump. And this is going to be a little more complex than going to be. Any question, comment so far? Yeah. So, uh, when you showed an example of uh, SVD, so uh -huh. we had uh, the original eigenvalue matrix was of it had three eigenvalues, and right. we said that okay, we can reduce it to two, right. and then we did the reduction. So let's talk about larger numbers. Suppose we have uh, a seven hundred uh, thing, 
How many numbers we should reduce to? Yes. Okay. So there is um, okay. So there is a nice answer for that. There are methods for that. Okay. How many how many eigenvalues you should choose based on the dimension and the complexity of your matrix actually has basically entropy. Okay. If your uh, you know data set is uh, so nearby in the vector space, then you do not need so many dimensions. Mm -hmm. If it is more complex, then you need more more dimension. So on the contrary, if you talk about NLP, so what to say gives you different kinds of word value, 300, 700, 1000 dimension. So what to use word? So basically those are eigenvalues. You can think about analogic ways. So eigenvalue, you know, factorization. So ideal case, if you have more complex machine transmission, use the higher one because you need more information. But if you are doing classification kind of thing, simple, so lower dimension also works. Okay. But, but depending on my task or choice, um, so so yeah so, so that's why empiricism comes into picture right and that's that's why you know 2009 you know EMNLP them. so ACLS conference and people say of oh, empirical method of natural language processing so I'll do empiricism and I'll prove I'm not going by the theories I'm tired of theories so I'll do empiricism now okay so do empirical analysis and then tell the report what is needed good so where TF IDF and all these oh, so TF IDF is actually the point just before the correlation coefficient error. Okay, so TFI is the basic, but that was not enough. Mm -hmm. Then people started going. Before course. Correlation mm -hmm. coefficient. Yes. Good. What do I do? And this is going to be. We're not talking about the technical difficulties of doing the three D, but there is like a. I did not talk about. I will talk about. So even even I did not talk about uh, beam search. I'll I'll touch there. So, so computation problem. Yeah. So okay. So let's first look at one. I believe you know this, but still good to show. This is an online projection of what to pick. And you can visualize. This is what to pick, right? So, what happens? If you search for a word, as a bike, you get all the related terms nearby, right? Bicycle, motorcycle, and so on. And here you see, over the time, these are these are both from use. Uh, so people actually started uh, creating, uh, you know, visualization methods and how you can visualize. Because it's a very high level. And it's only three dimension you will be visualizing now. So anyway, I, I'll not talk about them. So let's get, get back to that work here. Now pay full attention. We have a lot of maths. Okay, so uh, if you download what to get by, you might see this one, right? A lot of numbers. And you might wonder that what does it mean? So it's okay if you don't understand. Okay. This is not for human to understand. These are vector spaces. Okay, how to make human understandable if you know vector space? I'll talk about that. But let us first understand what has been done. Okay. So what is the problem? The problem is two words. I'm trying to predict context given a word. So two way, either given a context, I'm trying to predict word, or reverse, I'm giving a word, trying to predict context. Okay, so there are two methods Mikolov proposed. What is Siba? One is Kibra. Right? So let's talk about them. And so what is the you know, method? So I will do this one. I'll optimize the error. The context what? is specified only in terms of the words in the corpus, right? Right, absolutely. Now I will try to minimize what in it. One minus probability of WT, which is the word given the context. Now let's say for simplicity, this is the previous word is my context. Okay, W minus T. I'll look at many position in the big language corpus, and I will keep adjusting my vector representation of a word to minimize the loss. This is my problem statement. This is two dividing. Okay. 
So there are two, as I said, two algorithm proposed. One is skip gram and continuous back of course. So what I typically do, I typically pick skip gram because this is a little complex. If you understand skip gram, then it is very easier for you to understand SIBA. Okay, so I will teach you skip gram. Now, okay, go on. In the previous slide, in the previous slide. Uh, you said that you keep adjusting the vector representation to minimize loss. Like, uh, how, 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 how I'm, I'm coming? Allow me that time. Okay, so here it is. The problem formulation. Make sure you understand. Okay, so <laughs> this is the SIBA. Okay, how it works. So you have a sequence. So basically, the quick fox jumps. And what you are trying to do, predict the center one, right? So context and target. That's your problem with me. What is the reverse? The skip graph. So what you are trying to do, you are giving this word and trying to predict the context. Not at a single go, but in multiple goes. Okay. So here is your fox. You are trying to predict quick. Here is fox. Try to predict, you know, brown, jump, over, so on. So this is the two problem statement. Okay. Okay. Skip down also has some kind of uh, strong holding the NLP community. So I I told about it, right? So we have been talking about grams, two grams, three grams, and etc. People seen in many applications, typically IR people, seen there are sometimes you know uh, consecutive word does not make any sense. You can skip one, skip two. And that also holds a lot of value. This is the topic modeling. That era of topic modeling. Okay. So skip now has a great value. So it's a, it's a kind of mixture of statistics, language, and IR data. But Dr. Das, how, how can you certain that the, the previous word is not that important? In some context, it's mostly important. No, no, no I'm not saying it's not important. It depends on depends on the problem. Let's say IR era. The problem is we are getting so many web pages, you want to uh, classify them into some category. This is sports, this is entertainment, this is world business, blah, blah. And instead of looking at, you know, because see, if you look at sequence, some sequence you might get, you know, verse, conjunction, et cetera, not, not important. But if you do topic modeling, basically skip drum kind of modeling, you are jumping words, but that makes sense. So depending upon your situation. Okay, problem statement is clear. That seems exponentially harder than yes so that's why i'll teach that okay so that you if you understand that you understand this okay here are your question mega now let's pay attention here this is the setup so what is the setup now i have input now let's say toy example i have five words in my vocabulary how many five okay and i'm giving input so what is my center word this w3 is my word the center word in the skip club Okay, and I am giving this input to a hidden layer neural network setup. And what I am trying to predict, I am trying to predict three words. Three, three okay, three context words. <clears throat> if you forget, I am trying to predict three or four context words. So this is my input word, fox, and I am trying to predict quick, brown, jump, and over. Right? I am trying to predict three. That's it for the for the discussion thing. Those are three hidden layers. Those are three hidden layers. Right? So my vocabulary size is five. I'm trying to predict what? Three words. Now you might ask, okay, why well, I have this five here? Because it's a, it's a probability center. So you're doing what? Softmax. So you have to calculate probability of all the possible five words. So your every word is basically a softmax of five. Including itself. Include itself, right? Now you might ask, okay, who? I mean, how did you get this ten commandment? Or Nicola got this ten commandment that the you know, hidden size is three. So here's the idea. The idea is we need to squeeze the vector space, right? So how do you decide the size of hidden layer? Three, two, one. So the idea is it has to be lesser than your input layer. Otherwise, you are not squeezing down. Right now, you might ask, okay, three or two. I, there's no answer for that. So three for the time being. Okay. Now there's a there's a you know significant change here. This is 2013, just before the you know neural network boom. 
So though, those, it's okay, again, this is not a complete neural network. Why? Because typically what happening in RNA data, we have summation activation. We have no activation function here. We have no ReLU, we have no Sigma or anything else. What we have? Only summation in the hidden layer, right? So this is my setup. Everybody understood? Now what we have, we have two set of weights. What is the weight? So let's say this is my weight. W11 is basically the you know weight from W1 to H1. Okay. What is W12? The you know weight from W1 to H2. What is W13? W1 to H3. Similarly, what is W21? W2 to H1. What is 22? W2 to H2. What is 23? W2 to H3. Fine. Similar. So I have this matrix. Similarly, from hidden layer to the output layer, what I have, H1 to O11 is basically W dash 11. Then W dash 12 is basically this one. Then W dash 13 is basically this one. And so on. So I got two matrix. So what is my job? Optimize these two matrix. Okay. So I have what? Forward pass, backward pass. Straight in this. So now we'll see step by step. What we will do by forward pass? What we will do by backward pass? Okay. Any question here? No. Okay. Now quickly, why short max is very important. So this is the you know fundamental idea of beam search developed by Raj Reddy back in seventies. Okay. Instead of greedy search, you do what? This beam search, right? Although the idea theoretically exists. But this is so complex that people could not compute this at that era. So it was only a paper, only a concept exists. Okay. So what Binsa says, so if this is typically happening in natural language processing. When you try to predict the next word, if your vocabulary is very big, you might tend to get multiple words which are probability same. So you don't know what to pick. So if you take the first one, your next path might be dependent on that. If you do the next one, something. So Raj Adi says, okay, let, let us define a beam. So how many words are we picking up here? There's a two. So I will do a path traversal for both the both the two, and I will finally reach out to the end and find out what is the best path. You understand? This is the problem definition of beam search. Now, if you start increasing beam, what will happen? Explore computation, right? Even if you want to do five and six, Today we do the actual 10 and 11. We have so much computation. But that day two even was impossible. So that's the reason of taking this. Okay. So I'm just, you know, I'm just telling you, Nikolov did not do this by 10 commandments or by you know sleep. He got a dream and do it. So every component has historical connection. So this is the connection of this you know, layer, output layer with the beam search. This is the connection of dimensional reduction, SVD. Okay. So you draw the connection. How we could have reached out here. Okay. If the problem is statement is clear, now let's move, let us move. So what do you want to do? Calculate. So we can do what? Very simple. So what we are doing. So if we consider we have a vector for each word, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we say x1 is my vector for the double one. X2, x2, x5. So we have all the words, right? So what you need to do? We need to do this, right? What we are getting in H1? W11 into X1. W121 into X2. And so on. Clear? I can write this in a very simple way. W transpose X. Clear? It's not very complex. Very clear. Right? So this is my hidden layer representation. I'm getting my two matrix. Multiplication. Fine? Same way. Okay. Now I have to calculate weight from hidden layer to the output layer. Okay. So what I'm saying that net. So this is a different, uh, you know, representation, but it has a reason. So net O O O one one. So basically O one one is we are representing as U one one. What is that? W dash one one. W dash one one into H one. So H one and W dash one. That is my weight. And W dash two one H two. This is going there, right? And similarly, this one, W dash three one into what is that? 
Similarly, I can write for all the U11, U12, U13, U14, and so on. So what is my context size? Five. One to five. So what is my output layer now? W dash transpose H. And I can rewrite this way. Now understand? This is my you just said context size is five, right? Right. Why is it three then? No, no. So sorry, sorry. So context. Uh, oh, so vocabulary size is uh, you know the five, and you know context is three. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So this is my setup. This is my forward part. So this is how I am calculating the weights. So what is my goal to achieve? I want to optimize all these W's. I want to fix all these weights, and this is a shallow network. One layer, right? Now let's see how we can do that. Come on. Okay. So I'm I'm doing part now. For each context, uh, you know, output, I have a softmax. So I'll be calculating what net of O11. Forget about epsilon. That is uh, norm. So I'm doing what? I'm just averaging out all, all the things. O11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Simple softmax. I don't think this is complex, right? So this is this is my I'm talking about y11, okay? And I'm just rewriting this of the u e u11 and so on. Just a mathematical simplicity. Clear? I'm giving pause so that you know you can kind of digest it. What I'm saying. Clear? Now. Now the, the hardest part. And let us pay attention more here. So what to do what? Calculate the errors. So basically, back propagation. And optimize this way so that I can get something. What something I'll talk about that later. But let's just pay attention here. So let's say it's not problem formulation. I have W1J, 2J, and 3J are the actual word output for a given single input of WR. So what is 1J, 2J? So let's say. Yeah. So let's say J is something. Okay. Let's say J is 2. So basically 1J is 1, 2. It is 2. Uh, 2J is 2, 2. And uh, 3J is 3, 2. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is a trick you have to understand. So the, the neural network is not getting trained to predict this whole sequence at once. It is predicting the Jth word in all the windows. So it is it is optimizing. So it is taking the this one. This one and this one, and trying to optimize. And the second term, it is taking this one, this one, and this one. Why so? Otherwise, there might be. So, beam search, we are not doing still, right? So, if we can do beam search, that would be a different story. But why so? Otherwise, there might be a repetition of words. So, I am optimizing all the three windows at the same time, all those positions, and I'm doing the repetition. Understood? This is the setup. So basically, it's a sliding window kind of effect. So at one go, I'm doing this, this, this. I can go, we are doing this, this, and this. This way. Good again. Okay, so here's the way. So we have the, you know, you have the J context window, and it could be, you know, one to five. And what do we have to try to do? So this is our problem formulation, right? Given the WI, I'm trying to predict. This one, right? 1J, 2J, you know, 3J. I can also rewrite this as CJ context, context number okay, one to three. So I'm trying to predict these words. So I have to, I want to maximize the probability of this one and I want to minimize the loss. The so loss means minus loss. So one minus the forget about one. So this is my problem formulation. Good here. So I can rewrite this this way. We already talked about this uh, softmax function. I can take a summation c equal to one to three because we are doing what for three. So I can rewrite the softmax function here. It's for u c j. What is c? Context j is the length. Okay, probability. So I can rewrite this way. Clear? If you have lost, I will I will not not go forward. But if your face says lost, I don't understand. You don't understand. You remember this one? Okay, so what we are doing, we are writing the word and we have we have the real word. So what we need to do? Calculate the error. Right? So this is my output. 
So I have to do what? Do a calculation based on that. I just rewrite them. What I wrote in net. The format. Okay. So now I can rewrite this in a very simple way. I mean, I can make a summation here. I can do this way. And these are all mathematical simplification. I don't think you are getting any problem to understand this one. It's not visible. Uh, okay. Do you make a summation here and go on. Now let's. So what do you need to do now? So this is my error. So I write E. Okay. So now I have what? Log of C equal to one to C context. And I have the summation a u to the power uj and ucj. And I can, can I write this way? Simple log, right? Minus, I can write, right? So I just make it to c log, you know, this one and that one. Okay, now taking derivative. Why derivative? Because we have to learn the gradient, the loss function, right? So what I'm taking gradient of, I'm taking the gradient of ucj. What is ucj? So C is which window it is? One, two, three. So C is that number. What is J? Which number of words? So U C J is mine. So I have to calculate this gradient for the particular, you know, weight W dash one one based on what? Every cell. I have to update. Agreed? So I'll do what? I'll do calculate error with the gradient or partial derivative of. UCJ. Right? So derivation is very easy. Log is equal to if I do partial derivation. What by? Good. So I'm doing the exactly same thing. Okay. So I take it UCJ by this one, and I'm just taking the you know uh, that that one comes here. I just rename it JCJ and I just simply rewrite this whole one YCJ and JCJ. And that's my error. Simple partial derivative, not anything extra. Clear? Yeah. So what will happen? Actually, you know, to understand in layman way, Z is equal to one. If the J to one of the CS context window is actual output, otherwise it would be zero. That's the way to read this. Now we have simplified understanding. So what we did now? We just calculated error. What do you need to do now? Two more steps. We have to update the weights from the output layer to hidden layer and hidden layer to input layer. And what to do again? Forward, again backward. So let's see the updation. Now is the updation. Okay. So what we'll do? We'll do the error of 011. You remember 011, the first cell in the first block. We'll be doing what? We'll be calculating the gradient of that based on the error function based on W dash one one. What is W dash one one? The weight from the hidden layer one to O one one. So I will calculate what the gradient of the particular weight with respect to the error. Clear? So how I can do that? Okay. So here it is. So now understand this formulation first. Rest is very easy. So this is actually the chain rule typically applies in the neural network. Okay. What do you have? If you don't have an activation function, you have summation and output. Okay. So one is summation, you get all the weights into the summation, and then you do something to get the output down. Okay. And if you have these two components, you can actually do a chain rule. Why? That's a bigger story. I don't want to go there. But just trust me here, it happens. Okay. So what I'm doing, I'm applying this chain rule here. So my O11 is dependent on UC1, and I'm doing UC1 but W dash 11. What is UC1? If you forget, I actually need my, you know, my, you know, iPad here. So this is your UC1. You remember? So I am applying the chain rule here. So UC1 and UC1 by W dash one one. 
good here? Question? No. Okay. So then I sim then let me just you know do this. E of O one one we already did, right? Just did the last line. I'm just borrowing that here. Right? Understood? I know it, it takes time. Also, it, it took time for me. Don't worry. No. So I did this one in the last slide. Now I have to do what? U C one by W dust one one. U C one we already did, right? W dust H one and plus W dust two one plus blah blah, and this one. So what we have? We are renaming this as the H one. So what we have now then at the end of the story E U one and H one. I'm, I'm giving a pause here. Digest it. Any question here? Yes. Because it's a chain process, actually. You do a summation and then you go to out. So chain rule applies here because it's a multiplication. So if you're done with the gradient, what we'll do? Update the weight. So we take W dust one one and do what? Learning rate. You know learning rate, right? Gradient is everybody understand. And I'll do what? Multiply with my gradient. So that's what, that is what? That is the update. So when I'm going back, this amount of update, I will make in W dust one one. Clear? So basically now we just talked about Output layer to hidden layer. Right? Now what? Hidden to input layer. You can jump this. Okay. So now a little tricky, but we'll go through this. So what we are trying to do? We are trying to do error with respect to what? H1. What is H1? The first cell of hidden hidden uh, I know, layer. So we are calculating. The error gradient with respect to the hidden node one. Right? We can again apply the same chain rule. T E U C one. What is U C one? You remember? Net of all those you know soft max. U C one by H one. And if you understand the last slide, we can rewrite this as this one. And let's say what is U C one by H one. So if you if you do a derivative of U C one with the H one, let's say it is U one one, right? Yes. So you can rewrite as C, okay? And what will happen? W dash one one and so on. So W dash C one, H one, W dash C two, C uh, okay? And uh, C one and you know C one and H two. So if you do a derivative based on H one, what will you get? W dash one. Fantastic. That we got. That would just one zero. So this part is clear. This part is clear. We're still good. Yes. Good. We have another problem. What is the problem? So we only did error calculation based on the H one. We also have to do based on the weight W one one W two. So what we have another component is error calculation. With W11. Okay. Same chain rule applies. Error with H1, H1 with W11. Do I need to say this again? This part, I believe the chain rule applies. YCJ, JCJ. This one you already did, and this one. What is H1? What is H1? Hidden layer. W11X, and so on. And if I do a derivative based on W11, what I'll get? X1. Good. So you got what? X1. Good? Good. We are over. So that's it. Now what how, how I'll be editing the you know uh, weights? W11 new equal to W11 minus learning rate with my whatever either. 
and I'll be getting my done. We're done. We learn what to do. <laughs> okay. So what I'm getting at the end of the story, I'm doing all the ways sorted out. Okay, the first set of thing, second set of thing. But I have a very really interesting question. My favorite interview question I ask. What is the vector? If you know, don't don't stick up. My favorite, you know, interview question. Anyone comes to me if I interview, I ask the first question. So this is a, I'm, I, I say I okay, draw the what to get architecture. Yeah. How I'm getting the vector? What is my vector? I have a vector, right? At the end of the story, I have a vector. What is the vector? Yeah. Yes. So that's the answer. So this is your vector for this particular word. Understood? Now, okay. So this is true, false, full again top. So this is the you know answer. So hidden layer is your vector. Okay. Now whether this should be three, four, five, that's debatable question. But this is the output you get. If we have uh, more than like more number of hidden layers, no. So this is the shallow shader, right? So you did it for only one layer, and purpose to to learn the word effect. So we don't add layers. No. Just one hidden layer. Just one hidden layer. Yes. So that's the basic word to work. That's the basic word to work. Yeah. We are done with time today. Um, I'll be happy. You can stop recording or whatever. I'll be happy to take. And if you want to go to class, you can go. But if you have any question, feel free to ask. So, my question is, in the uh, I can recording. I don't think it was recording. Though. It was. Yeah. Yeah. So, my question is, in the input layer, we are giving all the words in our vocabulary, right? right? right. And um, we are trying to predict context. Okay. On the basis of one particular, one particular word. word. Okay. okay. So for that particular word, whatever uh, number, of, whatever we are getting in the hidden layer is, is the, the and that is going to change every time. Uh, I mean, suppose the, for this example, we are taking W3 and trying to predict the context. Right. For a different set of example, we can take W4 right. and do the same process. Absolutely. And the hidden layer that we get is going to be the uh, vector for W. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Das, how did this perform? That, that's a, that we will talk more on the next one. I mean, bad or medium or? So what to make at that time was the uh -huh. And obviously, after that, we don't know common except for the different families. But uh, it actually, uh, I would say, pumped up all the area of the team by more than five samples. That was a great success of what uh -huh. In 2013. 2013, yes. So, uh, this working and not understanding mathematically, mm -hmm. why is there a layer? Because there is no nonlinearity in between. So, there is no connected input to outputs and learn the way. Yeah. So, you want to reduce the dimension. And that reduced dimension was the dot. So, you could in impose a certain constraint on Right. So, so there is no nobody saying that you can't do you know similar ability composition or different kind of method. So that's a setup it will brought up. And this is a dimensional reduction mechanism. So sparsity does not reduce your number of calculations, I assume. Number of ways. Yes, but how about steps of calculation? Uh, I do like this process also. Strictly speaking, it does not reduce the number of steps. No, no. Number just will not reduce, but the computation will. Oh, no, I'm not saying that this is uh, much better than sparsity. I'm just saying they're bad in the equal ways. Yeah, that is, that's what I'm also trying to ask. That you could have done that, and they would be mathematically equivalent, equivalently good or bad in the same way. So, what was the meaning of this? Okay, so again, so uh, when it has been done, you don't have to talk about it. Uh, so what you were saying, but you can just go back. When it has been done, that was the, you know, even people have not been very sure about, you know, it was set up and so on. 
even uh, the first Arjun paper, a went to come four years later. You know? So that time, all those mechanisms, codes, and etc. Even you know, just you know, just I'm sharing my story. When the first word to get come, there was no tutorial, nothing available online. People like me who spend life in support system machine. So I literally, you know, open up C code, go through all the steps, and understand by myself. Okay. So those things were not available. Uh, if I if I want to say that. I want you to kind of at least reflect on something. Um the other day, this is about finding information, right? Much of this uh evolution is even in IR. Uh you talked about what you were 2013. Put in context, Tali met in the 2000s. Finding also on the web. And look at the 2002 paper, Semantic Enhancement Engine. I hope you guys go and see that paper, right? And uh, Semantic Content on the web paper. There are two papers. And the pattern, you know, the all came out in 2002, written in 2002. And look at that perspective, because how long it has taken. I think that as the time passes, more and more we understand the decision data alone and data and knowledge or separate. Change in context, the knowledge world, as opposed to trying to create context as you see in the world context. Yes? At the end of the day, this context is limited to what's in the text, right? Uh, as opposed to say, my context is this one. You see, remember I showed you a uh, classification of uh, pages in baseball. So the context is conceptual and conceptual baseball. And the knowledge that was, you know, all the themes and all the modeling that Simon had done in the baseball. Look at the distinction between the two. And how, it, and, and the interesting thing is, and what I marvel is that this still war had much larger number of people than the number of people in the line that I was pursuing. Right. But Dr. Shed, so Kali was uh, a knowledge base that was human curated, you said? No, uh, you, you are not in the class. I think there was this um, uh, uh, knowledge extractors and, and that were, you know, or the new knowledge was added all automatically. Yeah. There was a human uh, uh, verification or, uh, you know, occasional uh, human involvement was there. I had that, that whole 25 domain knowledge graph. One model that I have shown, and you can see up in the pattern, that was managed by only two people, or yeah. seminar people. So, so what so I it could not be done, uh, you know, manually. Yes. So uh, what I would, what what I want is like Doctor Doctor Das showed a presentation for uh, for his uh, uh, line of thought. Can we have a resource that uh, that shares your line of thought on how it was technically? Uh, possible that, to is, do that. that is done in the 15 year paper. The, the, yeah. the article is Look at that. And that yes, is on that particular topic, that is what it does. 2002 keynote also. There's really so much, uh, and there's 2001 and 2003 keynote. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they, they all document this. Because, you know, I can write longer. Actually, um, um, about uh, eight years ago uh, or so, I encouraged my students to write. I just want to write a separate paper on all of these things. Uh, and it became, uh, well, we never completed. Uh, and as you find it, it became really complete, very big, and uh, structurally, we come out in the school. Uh, obviously, we want to publish paper first before, then there was still the value of the certain paper. So we never completed that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a big task. No, I, I have a huge admiration for those who can write books and um, uh, you know, um, in, in this kind of, you know, I, I would like to read the paper that this is technical aspect. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, share, I'll, I'll try to find it. It's still in Google Docs, and I'll, I'll find it. In six years, we should try to work on it. So. <laughs> uh, it takes, uh, you know, that's why we come down to something more manageable. That's why we need these uh, articles. Uh, you know, we have competing articles in the uh, uh, articles. Because it's still, you know, at the manageable time. The one is long and a lot of dedication and time it takes. It can be very valuable to do the, you know, the research, uh, you know, long term research. Uh, anyway.
I just wanted to share an anecdote, and this is something that I thought of in our discussion. So, context is contextual, and abstraction is abstract. So, in terms of context is contextual, so when we are talking in terms of statistical analysis, when we use the word context, in that domain, we always talk about the number of words around that particular word and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. You're absolutely right. And in fact, this is something that came up during my very first call with you, Dr. Shade, when I was discussing my favorite paper. Um, and you asked me, what do you mean by context? And I said, oh, it's the neighboring words. And then you told me your understanding of context, which was completely different in the knowledge domain. Yeah, so, there were enough words in the language. So that's why you're going to have multiple meanings for the same word. <laughs> and the word context is so. I, I, did I tell you at that time that I actually was, I gave a talk on context? No, context. It, yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and in that sense, the, in some sense, uh, I'm not against at all uh, uh, use of the word context that is good. It's yeah. probably appropriate. I am, um, however, making this point. All this is done in terms of finding the information or data for the and textual information. But machine transmission does not machine transmission does not require a language. What I'm saying is you were asking. But if you're still uh, yeah, the context, yeah, yeah. So there is a e par something on uh, the top, and uh, there is a bar e par uh -huh. plus plus that is being populated as a probability. Why uh -huh. e par? She was just explaining rack propagation in detail, right? Like, yeah, yeah. But how go. that uh, it's a new one. Loss function is come across because you on the left of the equation.